Okay. Navigation laws. Is everybody there? Navigation laws? Fantastic. All right. Did anybody have any questions about um, French and Indian War, Pontiac's War, Proclamation of 1763, or the issue of mercantilism as causes of the American Revolution? Yeah, Jalen. Yeah. So remember that policies have typically been between the British and Native American chiefs. There was tribute paid. They worked out sort of a cohesive deal of, of trade uh, in the region. But the new commander in chief for the British in North America was Jeffrey Amherst, who had served in the French and Indian War. And he no longer wanted to pay tribute to any tribes that had fought on the side of the French or were seen as possible enemies of the British and the colonists. So he decides, Pontiac, the Ottawa chief, decides to bring together a confederation of tribes from the Ohio River Valley all the way, all the way to the Delaware River Valley. So it included like the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, the Shawnee, um, the Delaware, and a series of attacks occur all the way from Detroit to the Lehigh Valley outside of Philadelphia. And this particular set of battles leads to eight colonial forts and settlements being destroyed, but it also leads to a rise up of colonial militia forces, vigilante groups like the Paxton Boys attacking Native American tribes and leading to the end of Pontiac's War. In response to Pontiac's War, the British are going to say, you know what, we don't want to pay for any more wars. The young king, George III, and Lord jo or, uh, Prime Minister uh, George Grenville say, enough is enough. We're going to put down a proclamation. And that proclamation line is like the Eastern Continental Divide of the Appalachians. No more settlement for colonists west. And that's a, the reason that Pontiac's War is an early cause of the American Revolution is because it leads to the proclamation line being drawn. Does that make sense? Did I explain that? Any other questions there? Sure? All right, cool. If, if anything else comes up, just let me know. So Pontiac is defeated. Remember, Amherst gives his men like Blankets filled with smallpox and infested with smallpox and stuff like that. All right. So we've talked a little bit about navigation laws before. They are not anything new. We discussed this during the colonial era. Technically, we're still in the colonial era. We've got navigation laws that were passed as far back as the 1650s when the English were at war with the Dutch. Keep in mind that the list of these naval, like, sort of navigation acts and laws, they are, they, they're typically tied to British naval wars because England doesn't want their mercantile goods falling into the hands of the, their enemies, nor do they want to have to compete. So we start to see, um, you know, navigation laws that are passed against France, against Spain. Um, it's not just the Dutch. Um, the irony here is that, for the most part, these laws are ignored in the colonies by colonial merchants and by colonial officials that are appointed by the crown, because a lot of these colonial officials and even some of these colonial governors are on the tape. They're like accepting kickbacks and graft uh, to turn a blind eye to the smuggling. And obviously, smuggling's big business. Um, so what I want to point out here is that the like the act like the Molasses Act that was passed in 1733. In England it was taken seriously because they want they don't want to have to compete with any other country's sugar trade. And they certainly don't want their sugar or any of their other commodities in the hands of the French or any other enemy. But in the minds of the colonists, eh, 
no one's really enforcing it, so what does it matter? So I don't know if you've ever heard this term before, but the idea is, is that England does not want their enumerated goods. Have you ever heard of that term before? Yeah, no, maybe, all right. Enumerated goods like tobacco, sugar, rice, indigo, they don't want that falling into those hands. Um, again, people make a fortune off smuggling. One guy in particular that I want to point out is John Hancock. Hancock smuggled any and everything that he could get his hands on and basically had like a little merchant fleet of um, ships smuggling goods in and out of the um, out of New England and the Caribbean. Uh, this is a portrait of John Hancock by John Singleton Copley. Remember, he's one of the famous portrait artists we talked about. He's also the uh, Copley was one of Charles Wilson Peale's mentors and teachers. Um, Hancock not only gets wealthy off of smuggling, but he also has a very wealthy uncle, so he inherits a great deal of wealth. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again in case I didn't. But Hancock, the wealth that he gains as a result of smuggling and the wealth that he gains as a result of this inheritance, he is going to be a bankroll behind the American Revolution. And in, in sort of um, return for this, he wants to receive a, a military command. And that military command that he wants is command of the Continental Army when the war starts. Why might John Hancock not be the best option for commander of the Continental Army? Right. He doesn't have the military experience, whereas George Washington and other soldiers who had served in the French and Indian War in the capacity of commander might have more experience. So sort of as a consolation prize, Hancock's going to wind up receiving a really high political appointment and that appointment will be as president of the Second Continental Congress. And that's why we're remembering for the large signature um, on, the, on the Declaration of Independence, which we'll talk a bit about later. England's Privy Council. Has anybody in here ever heard of the Privy Council before? Did you guys ever you all talk about that last year? Okay. The Privy Council is kind of like the check and balance for the colonial governments. Um, and the premise here is that Colonial legislatures pass laws, and those laws have to be approved by Parliament. Um, so, you know, obviously there are laws that restrict the colonies from producing manufactured goods like woolen products. That's the whole mercantile system in action. The colonies are also limit, limited in terms of like their currency because they don't really have, they do have their own currency. They're, they're, almost forced to make it, but their currency is not really backed by any specie, like gold and silver. In fact, Virginia um, uh, cash dollars and coins that were minted in colonial Virginia were backed by Spanish shillings or British pounds or commodities like tobacco. Um, so a lot of colonies were not, they just didn't have a strong monetary system and they didn't have strong currency and the gold and silver got sucked out of their treasuries. So a lot of these folks are just gonna have to resort to bartering. That's why whiskey becomes a really big bar a, a big bartering good. I do wanna to point to the fact that the Privy Council, I guess we need to kind of look at this sort of like on, we wanna look at it objectively. Um, we obviously always wanna look at history objectively, but of the colonial laws that the Privy Council um, voided only 469 of 8,563 laws were voided or over or like you know um, vetoed by the Privy Council. So if we look on, on one side, hey, you know the the majority of the laws passed by colonial legislatures were accepted by the Privy Council. But if we look at on on the other side of it, those 40 469 times frustrated the colonies. So this is going to create some tension as well. Part of this is uh, actually the, um, the chattel slave system. On three different occasions, the um, House of Burgesses tried to get rid of the chattel slave system, but they were blocked because 
so many people in Parliament and you know investors in the transatlantic slave trade didn't want to see chattel slavery done away with in um, the the colonies, uh, especially Virginia, that was producing tobacco and other cash crops. So here we have um, Parliament. This is your two house legislative body in England, House of Commons and the House of Lords. All right, so let's talk a little bit about acts. Before I get into these, do, do you guys have any questions at all? We good? All right. The early acts that are going to be passed by the, the British are going to be levied on the colonies to pay for a third of the French and Indian War costs. That's what King George III and Prime Minister Grenville, uh, George Grenville, that's their expectation and the expectation of Parliament. Not everybody agreed with that, but for the most part, they didn't feel like there was going to be a lot of backlash because two-thirds of the tax burden was going to be on British citizens and other royal subjects, not the colonists. And you have to, there's like two starkly different perspectives here. The American colonists don't see that it's their responsibility to pay for this war. The British see that view that it is part, partly their responsibility because the war had been fought on American soil and British soldiers had been sent over to protect, quote unquote, the American colonists. But what you have to also understand is, is that colonial militia forces don't feel like they need British protection. They've been involved in a number of different Native American conflicts dating back to the 1600s. Not to mention this French and Indian War that dragged out eight to nine years on American soil. So the first acts that are going to be passed are going to be met with some feminine um, protest. The first act is going to be the Sugar Act. This Sugar Act is passed again to place an import tax on sugar coming into the colonies. The reason for that is to pay for soldiers and pay the tab for the skyrocketing debt that the British were dealing with as a result of the French and Indian War. What you have to understand is why would the colonists not want to pay a tax on sugar? Help me out here. Exactly. Excellent. Rum production, whiskey production, production of beer, production of wine, production of any other spirits requires a great deal of sugar. So that is the biggest, the biggest axe that's grinding here. Not only the producers, but also the merchants. They do not want to see a tax raised on sugar. Another thing that you guys need to realize is that colonial legislatures and the church already taxed the colonies. They feel like now they're going to be taxed for a third time. They're not, they're not too happy about that. The next thing is something that doesn't seem like a really big deal to us, but it actually has a lasting legacy in American history, and it's connected to our everyday lives, whether we know it or not, and that's the Quartering Act. The Quartering Act has passed, and this was not anything new, because troops had been quartered by colonists throughout the French and Indian War. And the Quartering Act basically said that British soldiers could move into colonial homes, move into colonial commons, move into colonial barns, and other colonial dwellings, and they could not only move in, but they could also be housed and fed by colonists. This is an invasion of what? Private, privacy, and property. Awesome. That is the fastest anybody's gotten that in the last few days. Very good. It's, a, it's an invasion of privacy and it's an invasion of private property. Very good. Do you all know that this is our third amendment? No quartering of troops. Okay? So that is a lasting legacy that stuck with us. What's up? That there could be an executive order, but I highly doubt that it would ever happen. Did they have it all this before? No. Well, 
voluntarily. If that makes sense. Yeah, but well, I don't want to go down this road because there's all there is going to be situations where the union your union occupation in the American South created a lot of turmoil because they they view, they viewed it as uh, enemy property. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we'll talk about that a bit later. You know, ninety nine percent of the American Civil War was fought in the South. Um, all right. So on the left, we've got uh, George the Third. On the right, Prime Minister Grenville. So within the first year, the Sugar Act is repealed. The Quartering Act is here to stay. It's not going to go away. In fact, we're going to learn about a key event that that has a connection to the Quartering Act today. So the next act that's going to be passed is the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is a tax on printed items. It's about 50 trade items as well as all diff, you know, certain types of commercial and legal documents. Um, wedding uh, marriage certificate, for example, would be taxed. You're looking at like a penny tax. But if you look at every, think of like in your life or in your family's life, every official document that is laying around your house, if every one of those was taxed, that might create some controversy. Ironically, the, t the stamp tax was much heavier on British citizens than it was the colonists. But there is an, another factor in addition to the actual tax itself. Those that violated the acts could be tried in admiralty courts. Admiralty courts were courts that did not provide a trial by jury. All right, solid. So that is a that's a big part of the of the tension um, that was caused by this. All right. So not only do the colonists feel unfairly treated, but they also feel that like, hey, wait a minute. We not only fought a war to settle in the Ohio Territory, we defeated Pontiac. And now we're being, you know, trampled, our rights are being trampled upon, not just with taxation, but also uh, in the, um, in the, in the, the potential for a trial in an admiralty court. So what I've provided for you here, this is a primary document on the left, that's what the stamp looked like, that would have been um, affixed to a document. And then on the right, I've got a, Broadside, or you guys remember what a broadside is? Like a poster that would have been hung up, um, like this one would have probably been hung up in the streets of Williamsburg. This is the place to affix the stamp. So instead of the stamp being up in the top corner of the paper, we've got the skull and crossbones. Death to the stamp ties. This is where the battle cry or the rhetoric slogan, no taxation without representation is tyranny, comes about. And it comes about from Massachusetts lawyer James Otis, who says, there's no reason that Parliament should be taxing their royal subjects in the colonies, because the colonies take care of their own taxes through legislatures and through the established churches in each colony. Therefore, since there's no colonial representation in Parliament, there should not be any taxation on the colonists. No taxation without representation is tyranny. So that's where this comes from. A lot of this is like lip service and BS because you know what? The colonists could have cared less about having representation 3,000 miles away in Parliament. Why? Why could they have cared less? Why could Massachusetts and Virginia and these other colonies, why could they have cared less about having a rep in Parliament? They're going to do their own thing anyway. They have their own, they've got their own legislatures in place, right? Plus, they already technically have representation, all right? 
And those representatives are either elected by the proprietors or they are put there by the crown. Who are they? They, these people are wealthy for sure. Yeah. Who, who, the, I'll repeat the question. What group of people are technically representing them anyway? This, you guys are on the right path. Yes, they are being represented by their part, by their, um, their representative government. But I'm talking about England. What English representatives are already there? Any ideas? What's that? What did you say? Uh, some of them could have been tied to that. I'm looking for royal governors and council, right? Commissioners, people that were appointed by the crown or are voted upon by proprietors, okay? So in response, the prime minister Grenville says, you all have virtual representation. Well, that too was BS because they're saying, we don't have virtual representation. We're represented by our own, our own um, legislatures. We pay our own taxes. You know, we don't, you all don't represent us. This is the, like the seed of people talking about independence, right? It hasn't been laid out yet, but this is where the wheels start turning of like, you know what, we're 3,000 miles away and, you know, we, and, you know, we've already talked about a lot of the um, early seeds of revolution. We talked about rebellions like Bacon's Rebellion and Lee Slater's Rebellion and the Boston Revolt and, you know, those events where people took up arms. But now you've got the rhetoric behind it. Taxation without representation is tyranny. We have no representation in Parliament. We represent ourselves. That, that, that type of slogan, that type of you know, uh, tagline, so to speak, is what is going to have people start to say, we're not British, we're Americans, all right? So the Stamp Act will ultimately be repealed as a result of public outcry, even though these early meetings to have it repealed were largely ignored in England. What they became known as, or what it became known as rather, is the Stamp Act Congress. The Stamp Act Congress was a intercolonial meeting in New York held by nine of the 13 colonies. Those that did not attend were Virginia, Georgia, North Carolina, and New Hampshire. Virginia actually had their own Stamp Act Congress that was led by Patrick Henry. What the Stamp Act Congress did was they put together a Declaration of Rights and Grievances, and even though they were ignored at first by Parliament, the Stamp Act will ultimately be repealed. But some major questions will arise. Why won't you pay your fair share, why won't you pay for the troops that have been sent to support you and to protect you? Another important thing arises out of the Stand Back Congress as well. The formation of a rebellious group of young men and women who decide that they're going to start boycotting British goods and terrorizing tax collectors. This group of people became known as the Sons and Daughters of Liberty. They did tea boycotts, sorry, they tarred and feathered, which was a horrible, uh, a horrible way to, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the tarring and feathering process, but basically boiling hot tars dumped on a tax collector and they're covered in feathers um, and tied to a rail and basically carried out of town. It was not only humiliating, but also painful and it would cause second to third degree burn. So it was bad. It was rough stuff. Eventually, the Stamp Act is going to be repealed. Uh, the Declaratory Act is going to be passed. And what this says is, you know what? We're going to repeal the Stamp Act, but 
if you guys don't follow suit, Parliament has the right to bind you up. And what they mean by bind them up is, what can they do? How might they bind up the colonies? Okay? So, sort of a figure of speech, but maybe with rope. Very good. Cut off supplies. What else? More what? Maybe levy more taxes. Other ideas? Send more what? Send more soldiers, right? How about more arrests? Strictly enforcing the navigation laws. These are all ways that, that they can bind them up through the declaratory acts. This is a pretty awesome political cartoon. This is a funeral procession for the Stamp Act. It's pretty funny. Got a little casket in the Stamp Act. Uh, you know, procession going through town. All right, we move now to the Townshend Acts. These are handed down by the head of the Treasury, Charles Champagne Charlie Townshend. Uh, Townshend was a bit of a booze town. Uh, famously gave some pretty ruckus, um, witty speeches in Parliament under the influence of alcohol um, that were pretty well documented. He decides to levy a series of, of little taxes on import goods. And those import goods would be lead, paper, paint, and tea. Why would these be unpopular? These are all very widely used and purchased supplies. And it's also in the minds of the colonists double jeopardy. They can't produce those. Those are produced by the crown. So they're now being, they're being even further limited. So this leads to um, continued, continued uh, outrage protest. Um, it also ultimately brings about an end to the Townshend Act. Lead, paper, and paint will be dropped um, and it will just turn into the Hated Tea Act. So the Townshend Act was the, the inception of the Tea Act. Um, before uh, the Townshend Acts were repealed, Champagne Charlie dies of fever at the young age of 42 years old, um, and he will be replaced by Lord Frederick North. So we have Lord North. There's Charles Townshend on the left, Frederick North on the right. Something I wanted to point out that, we, that I, I glanced over there, or I just wanted to go back to. Notice in 1767, New York's legislature was suspended for failure to comply with the Quartering Act. The Quartering Act will remain unpopular, and the Quartering Act is the cause for the very famous Boston Massacre. Troops had been sent into Boston, they occupied Boston, occupied Boston Common. On the evening of March 5th, 1770, just outside of Boston Common, and if you guys ever have the opportunity to visit Boston, it's an awesome city, and I highly recommend you take part in the Freedom Trail. It's a fun little walk, it you know, might take you like half a day, and you can check out some of the really cool spots along the, you know, the, basically you can walk the, the trail at the start of the American Revolution from the, you know, the meeting house to the customs house to all the way to, um, to the Old North Church. So outside of Boston Common, the this military unit is drilling, and they are in formation. A group of kids come over, start yelling, hooting, hollering, cursing them out, throwing snowballs, throwing pieces of ice, throwing clamshells, and out pours a group of, of rope makers from some of the old local taverns. Um, one of the oldest taverns 
not far from this location is called the Bell and Hand. Um, you can also uh, stop. That's also placed along the Freedom Trail as well. So these folks are kind of spilling out of the bars, a bit of like a drunken mob. They start cursing, yelling, also throwing uh, different objects at the soldiers. A couple of them start throwing the rope clubs. I don't know if you're familiar with what a rope club looks like. It looks about like about the size of a t-ball bat, okay? So kind of like an old police billy club, right? Um, yeah, to beat out the ropes. So in this sort of chaotic scenario, people in the crowd are yelling, fire, fire, fire. The commander of the, of the, de the military detail does not yell fire, but troops fire anyway. And after it's all said and done, 11 are wounded, five are killed, and the Boston Massacre um, is like one of the early steps toward revolution. One of the martyrs that dies is a uh, former slave, Crispus Attucks, who is one of the leaders of the mob um, in the Boston Massacre. The soldiers are put on trial. They're defended by John Adams, who's a member of the Sons of Liberty with his cousin Sam Adams, but John Adams believes that they deserve a fair trial, um, so he will reluctantly uh, agree to defend them. Um, and what we have here is Paul Revere's etching of the Bloody Master. Do, I do want to point out that Paul Revere uh, plagiarized this etching. Someone did it before he did, but he got his hands on it. And he was a silversmith, decided to take advantage of the opportunity, and he's the one that published the engraving. All right, so as a result of the, um, as a result of the events of the Boston Massacre, a group forms as a result of this through the Sons of Liberty. I want to be very clear. Sons of Liberty are not limited to Boston. They exist throughout the colonies, right? There's only one colony that's real loyal, and that's Georgia. But even, there are even people in Georgia that are, have leanings toward independence. So that particular group becomes known as the Committee of Correspondence. And they've got guys like Sam Adams and guys like John Dickinson who wrote letters from a Pennsylvania farmer in response to the Townshend Act traveled along the committees of correspondence. This was a way to get information from place to place, and they used the same postal routes that Ben Franklin had established with his colonial postal system. So, the Committee of Correspondence, it opens up communication, it keeps the revolutionary spirit alive. I do also want to point out the Boston Massacre and what we're about to learn the Boston Tea Party, which many of you all, all have heard the story before, they're not the only colonial protests, all right? Uh, the custom ship Gatsby was burned um, in Rhode Island in 1772. There were uprisings in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, protests in Williamsburg, Virginia. Boycotts and protests in Newburgh, North Carolina. Halifax, North Carolina. The list goes on and on and on. So it's not just limited to Boston and New England, all right? So, Sam Adams will send a series of letters of appeal to the Massachusetts Royal Governor, Thomas Hutchinson, in July of 1773 to repeal the Tea Act. Here's Sam Adams, another portrait by John Singleton Copley. Um, Sam Adams, failed brewer, FYI, did not make it as a brewer. Yeah. <laughs> they changed it up. They changed it. So here's the thing. He, uh, yeah, he, he was a fail. He failed at pretty much every, all of his business ventures, um, and he finds uh, he finds a, a niche in law and in what I would call being a professional malcontent. So uh, I love what's going on in this image because that is Sam Adams to a T. He wore that red suit. Uh, it's like a reddish burgundy 
type suit and this like gray sort of cockeyed wig. Um, that was that was the way that Sam Adams uh, regularly dressed um, during the pre-revolutionary era. And he's going to be not only an influential member of the Sons of Liberty, but he is also one of the key leaders in the Boston Tea Party. Keep in mind, the British East India Company had a stranglehold and monopoly on tea coming in and out of colonial America. It's not like the colonists could produce their own tea. They were at the mercy of the British East Indian Company. So the British East India Company moves all this tea into different harbors, and they're not going to move it out until it gets sold. So in retaliation of this tea sitting in the harbor and the hated tea act that had was a part of what stuck around from the Townshend Act, Sam Adams, Paul Revere, and members of the Sons of Liberty meet in the South Meeting House in Boston, and they decide, you know what we're going to do? We're going to dress up as Mohawk Indians, we're going to raid these ships, and we're going to dump all of the tea in the harbor. So on December, the evening of December 16, 1773, the Sons of Liberty disguised as Mohawk Indians, dumped 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. It's like a million dollars worth of tea in today's money. And it creates a big problem. Number one, it's a step toward revolution. Number two, the other problem is it really hurts the uh, Boston fishing industry for an extended period of time because it pollutes the harbor. So the Boston Tea Party has some major implications. I like what Edmund Burke here declared, to tax and to please no more than to love and be wise is not given to men. Burke was one of these members of parliament who became known as the Whigs. The Whigs are a group of people in the House of Commons who early on said, you know what, maybe we just want to let them have their own independence. Maybe leave them alone. Um, so we'll talk about that group a bit later. Again, the Boston Tea Party is not your only protest. There's also protests in Annapolis. In fact, after these events, you're going to start seeing tea move out of other colonial harbors uh, out of fear that there's going to be some um, you know, copycat uh, type of protests um, throughout colonial America. All right. Any questions about the Boston Tea Party? So, Parliament, in response, will pass what is known as the Intolerable Acts. Well, they call them the Coercive Acts. Um, the, the Bostonians called them the Intolerable Acts. What it did was it shut down Boston Harbor, not allowing supply to get in. It shut down town meetings. It suspended their, royal, their um, charter until all the tea was paid for. This sends out shockwaves throughout the colonies. And it's important to, to note that it's unifying because people, as a result of the passage of the Coercive Acts and the Intolerable Acts, through the committees of course, correspondence, decide, you know what, we need to come together. We need to meet about the, these acts. And it's going to lead to an early meeting known as the First Continental Congress that we're going to talk about here shortly. It also has very big implications for Virginia. Virginia decides that they are going to send supply to Boston and have a day of prayer and fasting as, as a result of the passage of these acts. The last royal governor of Virginia, Lord John Murray Dunmore, shuts down the House of Burgesses as a result of that is when the House of Burgesses starts moving to become one. Very good, awesome job. The Virginia General Assembly, okay? That is what's going to lead to the first Virginia Convention and the second Virginia Convention. So we'll talk about those conventions here in a little bit. All right, another act that's passed that was really controversial was the Quebec Act. The Quebec, oh, I also forgot to call the the Intolerable Occurrence of Acts were also known as the Repressive Acts. Um, 
So the Quebec Act is another slap in the face to the colonists because it allows religious freedom to French Canadian Catholics. It expands the Canadian, British Canadian province from Quebec back to the Ohio River Valley. Why might this be problematic? Exactly. Well done, Hunter. They just fought for that. They fought those very people for that, and now they're seeing the British saying, oh, you know, you guys, feel free to go back. You know, if it's a British province, go on and settle back in that territory, whereas the colonists could not. So, again, Quebec Act, very controversial, and that directly ties in to the proclamation of 1763. So here we have a colonial tax protest. All right. You guys have any questions? We're going to pump the brakes for a second. Sound good?